Well, thank you all uh, for coming. I've been filming in the Marshall Islands, which lie north of Australia in the middle of the, of the Pacific. Now, whenever I tell people that, they ask, uh, where is that? And if I offer a clue by referring to bikini, they'd say, ah, oh, you mean the swimsuit. <laughs> now few, few people seem aware that the bikini swimsuit was named to celebrate the nuclear bombs that destroyed Bikini Island. 66 nuclear devices were exploded by the United States in the Marshall Islands between 1946 and 1958. That's the equivalent of 1.6 Hiroshima bomb explosions every day for 12 years. Bikini is silent today, mutated and contaminated. The palm trees grow in a strange grid fa formation Nothing moves, there are no birds, the headstones in the old cemetery are alive with radiation. My shoes registered unsafe on a Geiger counter. Standing on the beach, I watched the emerald green of the Pacific fall away into a vast black hole. This was the crater left by a hydrogen bomb they called Bravo. The explosion poisoned people and their environment for hundreds of miles, perhaps forever. On my return journey, I stopped at Honolulu Airport and picked up an American magazine called Women's Health. On the cover was a smiling woman in a bikini <coughs> swimsuit, and the headline, You too can have a bikini body. A few days earlier in the Marshall Islands, I'd interviewed women who had very different bikini bodies. Each had suffered thyroid cancer and other life-threatening cancers. Unlike the smiling woman on the cover of the magazine, all of them were impoverished, all of them the victims and guinea pigs of a rapacious superpower that is today more dangerous than ever. Now, I relate this experience really as a warning and to try and break a silence, rather to break a distraction that has consumed so many of us. The founder of modern propaganda, Edward Bernays, described this distraction, and I quote, as, and I quote, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the habits and opinions of democratic societies, he called it an invisible government. Now we're meeting this evening on the campus of a great university, storehouse of knowledge, surely a center of debate and free speech. But how many studying here are aware of the story of Bikini and its critical relevance to their lives today? How many are merely trained to respect propaganda? How many of us are aware that a world war has already begun? True, at present it's a war of propaganda, of lies and distraction, and of censorship by omission. That can change overnight. Let me give you one example of this propaganda. In 2009, President Obama stood before an adoring crowd in the centre of Prague, in the centre of Europe, and he pledged himself to make, and I quote, the world free from nuclear weapons. People cheered and some cried. A torrent of platitudes flowed from the media. <coughs> Obama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It was all fake. He was lying. The Obama administration almost immediately launched a program to build more nuclear weapons, more nuclear warheads, more nuclear delivery systems, more nuclear factories. Nuclear warhead spending alone rose higher under Obama than under any other American president. 
The cost over 30 years is estimated at $1 trillion. A mini nuclear bomb is planned. It's known as the B61 Model 12. <coughs> Sounds like a Volkswagen. There's never been anything like it. One of America's top generals, General James Cartwright, the former head of the Strategic Air Command, has said, and I quote him, going smaller makes this nuclear weapon more thinkable. In the last 18 months, the greatest buildup of military forces since World War II, led by the United States, is taking place along Russia's western frontier. Not since Hitler invaded the Soviet Union have foreign troops presented such a demonstrable threat to Russia. Ukraine, once part of the Soviet Union, has become a CIA theme park. Having orchestrated a coup in Kiev, Washington effectively controls the regime that's next door and hostile to Russia, a regime rotten with Nazis, literally prominent parliamentary figures in the Ukraine are the political descendants of the notorious anti-Semitic OUN and a UPA fascists. They openly praise Hitler and call for the persecution and expulsion of the Russian-speaking minority. That's not what you read, of course, in the news. In Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, on Russia's frontier, the US military is permanently deploying combat troops, <coughs> tanks, weapons. Now this extreme provocation of the world's second nuclear power, Russia, is met with silence in the West, especially in Australia, the most silent of all, the land of willful ignorance. What makes the prospect of nuclear war even more dangerous is a parallel campaign, propaganda campaign, against China. Seldom a day passes when China is not elevated to the status of a threat. Count the America, American admirals who fly in with their scare stories about China. Each has given unctuous, uncritical front page treatment. According to Admiral Harry Harris, the Pacific commander, China is, and I quote, building a great wall of sand in the South China Sea. What he's referring to is China building airstrips in the Spratly Islands, which are the subject of a dispute with the Philippines, a dispute of little consequence until Washington pressured and bribed the government in Manila and Admiral Harris launched a propaganda campaign called Freedom of Navigation. What does this mean? It means freedom for American warships to patrol and intimidate and then dominate the coastal waters of China. Try to imagine the American reaction if Chinese warships did the same off the coast of California. I made a film called The War You Don't See, in which I interviewed distinguished journalists in America and Britain, reporters such as Dan Rather of CBS, Raggy Omar, the BBC, David Rose, of the observer. All of them said that had journalists and broadcasters done their job and questioned the propaganda that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, had they not amplified and echoed the lies of George W. Bush and Tony Blair, the invasion of Iraq might not have happened and hundreds of thousands of men women and children would be alive today. The propaganda laying the ground for a war against Russia and China is no different in principle, but a lot more dangerous. Name a single journalist in Australia, an academic, a politician of any party, who has publicly and vociferously asked why China is building airstrips in the South China Sea. The answer ought to be glaringly obvious. The United States is encircling China with a network of bases, ballistic missiles, battle groups, 
nuclear armed bombs. This lethal arc extends from right here in Australia to the islands of the Pacific, the Marijuana, the, Ma the Marianas, the Marshalls and Guam, to the Philippines, Thailand, Okinawa, Korea, and right across Eurasia to Afghanistan and India and Pakistan. Look at the map. America has hung a noose around the neck of China. Australia, in America's pocket, is beckoning war with our greatest trading partner. Incredibly, none of this is news. Censorship by omission, silence by media, then war by media. In 2015, in high secrecy, Washington and Canberra staged the biggest single air-sea military exercise in history, known as Talisman Sabre. Its aim was to rehearse an air-sea battle plan, blocking sea lanes such as the Straits of Malacca and the Lombok <coughs> Straits, that cut off China's access to oil, gas and other vital materials from the Middle East and Africa. Silence. In the circus known as the American presidential campaign, Donald Trump is being presented as a lunatic, a fascist. He's certainly odious, but he's also a media hate figure, and that alone should arouse our skepticism. Trump's views on migration are grotesque, but no more grotesque than those of David Cameron or Tony Abbott or a couple of serving ministers in the current Turnbull government. It's not Trump who is the great deporter of people from the United States, but the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Barack Obama. According to one respected liberal commentator, Trump is, and I quote, unleashing the dark forces of violence in America. Unleashing dark forces? Really? Is he kidding? This is the country where toddlers shoot their mothers and the police wage a murderous war against black Americans. This is the country that has attacked and sought to overthrow more than 50 governments, many of them democracies, and bombed from Asia to the Middle East, causing the deaths, the untold, the deaths of untold numbers of people. No country, no country can equal this record of violence. It's systemic. And most of America's wars against defenseless countries have been launched not by Republican presidents, the Trumps, but by Liberal Democrats, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, Clinton, Obama. In 1947, a series of National Security Council directives described the paramount aim of American foreign policy as, and I quote, a world substantially made over in America's own image, unquote. The, idea, the ideology was messianic Americanism. We were all Americans, or else. Heretics would be converted, subverted, bribed, smeared, or done away with. Donald Trump is undoubtedly a symptom of this, but he's also a maverick. He said the invasion of Iraq was a crime. He doesn't want to go to war with Russia and China. How ironic. <laughs> the danger to the rest of humanity is not Trump, in my view, but Hillary Clinton. Mm. She is no maverick. She embodies the resilience and violence <laughs> of a system whose vaunted exceptionalism is a form of fascism with an occasional liberal face. As election day draws near, Clinton will be hailed as the first female president regardless of her crimes and lies. Just as Barack Obama was lauded as the first black president and liberals swallowed his drivel about hope. And the drool goes on. 
described by The Guardian columnist Owen Jones as, quote, funny, charming, with a coolness that eludes practically every other politician, unquote, Obama the other day sent drones to slaughter 150 people in Somalia. He kills people frequently, usually on Tuesdays, according to the New York Times, when he's handed a list for death by drone. That's cool. In the last presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton threatened, and I quote, to totally obliterate Iran with nuclear weapons. As Secretary of State under Obama, she approved the overthrow of the democratic government of Honduras. Her almost gleeful destruction of Libya in 2011 qualifies her as a Class A war criminal. When the Libyan leader, Colonel Gaddafi, was publicly sodomized with a knife, a murder made possible by American logistics, Clinton gloated over his death. He came, he saw, he died. One of her closest allies is Madeleine Albright, the former Secretary of State, who has attacked young women for not supporting Clinton. This is the same Madeleine Albright who once celebrated the death of half a million Iraqi children as, quote, worth it. Clinton's biggest backers are the Israel lobby and the arms companies that fuel the violence in the Middle East. She and her husband have taken millions of dollars from Wall Street She's corrupt and violent, and yet she's about to be ordained the women's candidate, to see off the evil Trump, the official demon. She's backed by distinguished feminists, Gloria Steinem in the US, and Summers in Australia. A generation ago, a modern, a postmodern cult, a postmodern cult, now known as identity politics, stopped many intelligent, liberal-minded people examining the causes and individuals they supported, such as the fakery of Obama and Clinton, such as the specious, such as specious progressive movements like Syriza in Greece, which portrayed the people of that country and allied with their enemies. Self-absorption, a kind of meism, became the new zeitgeist in privileged Western societies and signaled the death of great collective movements against war, against social justice, against equality, against racism and sexism. Today, the long sleep may be over, may be over. The young seem to be stirring again, slowly. Gradually, the thousands in Britain who supported Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader are part of this awakening, as are those who rallied to support Bernie Sanders. But is that it? In Britain last week, Jeremy Corbyn's closest ally, his shadow treasurer, John McDonnell, committed a Labour government to pay off the debts of piratical banks and to continue so-called austerity. No real change there. In the US, Bernie Sanders has promised to support Clinton if or when she's nominated. He too has voted for America's use of violence against countries when he thinks it's right. He says Obama has done a great job. No real change there. In Australia, we have a kind of mortuary politics <laughs> in which barren parliamentary games are played out in the media while refugees and indigenous people are persecuted and equality, inequality grows along with the danger of war. The Turnbull government has just announced the so-called defence budget of $195 billion. That is a drive to war. There was no debate, none. Silence. Why? In Australia, as in most Western countries, there's now a permanent government with two main competing factions whose social, economic and foreign policies are almost identical. Elections are now theatrical episodes in which copycat policies are ratified. As in war by media 
and silence by media, we now have democracy by media, and that's fake too. What has happened to the great tradition of popular direct action? Where is the courage, political imagination and commitment required to begin the long journey to a better, just and peaceful world? Where are the acclaimed artists, writers, playwrights, filmmakers in Australia? Perhaps enjoying their federal and state government prizes and patronage. For they're silent too. Of course, there are very honourable exceptions, including those who sponsored this meeting tonight and those who fought tenaciously, tenaciously for justice, for refugees, and those who fought tenaciously for justice for indigenous people, and those who last week exposed the bad government's attacks on the right to protest and of free speech. What they showed was that real dissent is becoming a crime. And that is the challenge for everyone here tonight. They, governments, elites, those who seek to control our lives must not get away with it. Break the silence or do we wait until the first nuclear missile is fired? Thank you. Thank you.